well and uh, a happy Sabbath to everyone in uh, Africa and uh, around these regions of the world. And uh, to the others, happy preparation day and welcome to our new series that is uh, the dress reform issue. And this is number one in the presentations, a series of presentations. Uh, and here we are going to deal with um, the question, the, the, dress, the dress question. I know this excites emotions, but uh, we thank the Lord that we can speak freely of the things he has provided for us in uh, his word. And so uh, welcome to you all around the world for this viewing, that uh, this material, whoever will come in possession with them will be uh, blessed and uh, the Lord continue guiding us. And so I welcome us for a word of prayer and then uh, we proceed. Our dear Father in heaven, thank you for opportunity of uh, sharing your word and communing together as brethren. We believe that uh, you want to sanctify us and make us whole again that uh, we may bear the image in every way you created us in thy likeness. And that is the likeness that we will desire to have back after this restoration. So speak to our hearts and enable us to listen to the voice of thy son as he speaks to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, the, the question of uh, dress reform is a very important question because every time the question is raised, uh, people are ready to talk about uh, uh, God looks at the heart and not at the outside. And uh, I believe with all my heart that uh, God looks in the heart of the people. And uh, it is in that heart that he causes a people who have been converted to be able to show forth his glory and uh, to, by their mannerism, to show that uh, they have been affected by that reformation that is being wrought in their hearts. The story of uh, Adam and Eve in the book of Genesis chapter 3 is very interesting. And it doesn't only depict uh, something spiritual happening to them, but something also physical happening to them. We understand that man, when he was created, he was in the likeness and the image of his maker. And uh, he didn't have this artificial clothes that we have, but uh, he was surrounded with uh, the light as his covering, not only to cover his nakedness, but uh, for the weather that was there in the Garden of Eden, he needed that uh, special garment. And so we also need the special garment that is the spiritual one and the physical one, not only for uh, the restoration of the image of Christ in us, the likeness in moral character, but also in the likeness of uh, his physical uh, appearance, uh, which is much important. And even the weather that is extreme uh, um, necessitates us to have garments that uh, will um, uh, be good to prevent us from getting diseases. But when you read the book of Genesis chapter 3, when man, when the glory of God was taken away from man, he covered himself with the garments, uh, the leaves, of the trees, but that was not enough for him because it didn't cover his nakedness, both spiritually and physically. And God had to pro to provide something for them. Not only was did he provide a garment that was covering them from top to the bottom, but also it was an enduring garment, which was made from actually the skin of the lamb that um, he had done. Uh, uh, sacrificed in the Garden of Eden, man had sacrificed in the Garden of Eden. And so that one alone teaches us that um, 
we can have our the dress of our own choice to cover our nakedness physically but also we need the prescription of God himself to give us the direction on what kind of garments he will desire us to have. We don't just dress because we need to dress. In the restoration of man, God told him in Genesis, in uh, Exodus, and uh, Exodus chapter 25, verse 8, build me a sanctuary that uh, I may dwell among you. But alongside that, there was specifics of uh, the dress of the people who ministered inside the sanctuary. And uh, thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary, who is like a God, who is like God, uh, like, like our God. And if we will understand better what it is needed of us, the best way to, the best place to head to is in the sanctuary. And uh, that is where uh, I want just to head uh, before I come back to some special things here. In the book of Exodus, um, in the book of uh, Exodus, chapter 28, from uh, verses 1, we read, and take thou unto thee Aaron thy brother and his sons with him from among the children of Israel that he may minister unto me in the priest's office, even Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, Eliezer, and Ithamar, Aaron's sons. So these were the priests who were serving in the sanctuary. And uh, thou shalt make holy garments for Aaron thy brother and those garments, they were for two purposes, for glory and for beauty. And thou shalt speak unto all that are wise-hearted, whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom, that they may make Aaron's garments to concentrate, consecrate him, that he may minister unto me in the priesthood office. There is something curious in uh, verse 3 that um, only those who are wise-hearted and filled with the spirit of wisdom can make the garments for those who minister in the presence of the Lord. Not anyone, not anybody is supposed to make the garments for those who minister in the sanctuary of the Lord. And that is why one of uh, the institutions for Seventh-day Adventists uh, to have is uh, the institution of dressmaking, garment cutting, and all this stuff, because not the people of the world do not understand the garments that the Christians should be having, more so those who are ministering before the Lord. And so the people who shall make the garments for the people of God should be wise and having the wisdom from God so that they may know what the biblical grace for a person who is standing before the Lord must have. Uh, and so these garments, when you go back to Exodus 28, verses 42, um, when you start from verse 36, and thou shalt make a plate of pure gold and grave upon it like the engravings of a signet, holiness to the Lord. And so also this outward garment, this outward cape that was, um, or plate that was on uh, the head of Aaron, the engravings were holiness to the Lord. And so our garments should preach holiness to the Lord. You know, people argue about the, heart god looks at the heart and not at the outside and he doesn't judge as man judges true that is the issue but uh, let us not escape some clear bible verses that speaks about these things the garments outside the head they were for glory first and then for beauty it was not uh inverted that beauty and then glory it was glory and then beauty and then when you go back when you go down in verse 36 the garment outside they had a signet of holiness to the Lord. And so our garments, before even we speak of anything, our garments should be uh, proclaiming holiness to the Lord. And thou shalt put it on a blue lace, that it may be upon the might, upon the forefront of the might it shall be. So our garments have a blue lace. And this, this one was to signify that we are obedient to the law of God. So our dress 
should be according to the prescription of the law of God. And this is why what we are trying to uh, bring out, that it may be upon the might, upon the forefront of the might, it shall be, and it shall be upon Aaron's forehead that Aaron may bear the iniquity of the holy things, which the children of Israel shall hallow in all their holy gifts, and it shall be always um, upon his forehead that he may be accepted before the Lord. When you go to verse 42, the next thing, so we see that the garments were for glory, number one, and then for beauty. Number three, they were to declare holiness. They were to declare that we are commandment-keeping people. And number four, and thou shalt make them lean and breeches to cover their nakedness from the loins even unto the ties they shall reach. And so our garment, uh, the, the other important aspect of our garment, it should cover nakedness and uh, Somebody may ask, where does nakedness begin and where does nakedness end? And these are the kind of things that we are going to address in this uh, uh, the dress uh, uh, the dress series. Now, why not speak about Jesus and leave the dress alone? Why speak about dress? Sister White talks about this issue of dress, not speaking about dress every now and then. In fact, she says... Um, if uh, people are converted, they wouldn't need to be talked about dress. So the great issue is conversion. It's not about the dress. And so I want just to say that in the beginning that the great issue here is conversion. It is not the dress thing. We are only uh, addressing the dress question so that maybe somebody who has been struggling with something uh, may be able to find this information. There are people who don't have the information and they perish. My people perish because they lack knowledge. That is the main reason why we are putting out information. But the greatest thing that we are suffering from is the issue of conversion. And so if people can be converted, then we won't have anything to speak about dress. You don't find the dress question spoken a lot in the Hebrew community or in um, ancient Israel, because this was something natural unto them. The people of Middle East, uh, uh, dress reform is something natural inborn in them. The, the whole issue of uh, dress reform is only found out amongst other people because it is not something natural to them. And then the second thing it is that uh, they have not given fully themselves to the Lord. And the third thing is that uh, people have been kept ignorant about these things not much information is being given outside there about the dress question. But again, why, why speak about dress reform? Why not speak about Jesus Christ? People accept Jesus Christ and then they, they, they reform dress. Uh, the, the, the reason for speaking about dress reform is given in uh, Testimonies to the Church, Volume 1, page uh, 465, paragraph 2. And I'll be going through the whole chapter of... Uh, uh, um, dress reform, that is chapter 83 in uh, Testimonies to the Church, Volume 1. So why speak about the dress reform? Another reason which I offer as an apology for calling attention to the subject of dress is that not, not one in 20 of the sisters who profess to believe the testimonies has taken the first step in the dress reform. It may be said that Sister White General wears her dresses in public longer than the dress she recommends to others. To this I reply, when I visit a place to speak to the people where the subject is new and prejudice exists, I think it is best to be careful and not close the ears of the people by wearing a dress which would be objectionable to them. But after bringing the subject before them and fully explaining my position, I then appear before them in the reformed dress, illustrative of my teachings. Now, notice this carefully. Number one reason why she speaks and offers an apology for calling an attention to dress reform, because this is something she said, let not the dress reform be hammered to the people and let not uh, the health reform be hammered to the people. Preach Jesus Christ to the people. And when they are converted, the issue of um, health reform and dress reform will take its place. But then she gives an apology why you should have to bring this to our attention. Why? Number one, because not one in 20 of the sisters who profess, not, not the people who have not received Christ, but the people who profess to have gotten the truth, 
do not dress according to what the testimonies are say number two why she has to bring to attention the issue of dress reform is um because uh people are saying that she doesn't dress the way she recommends in her testimonies and this she had to reply that uh, when she visits a place to speak to the people where the subject is new and prejudice exists um it is best to be careful and not close the ears of the people by wearing a dress which will not be objectionable so she was wearing a uh, long, long address in public. Because naturally, if you go to preach to the Eastern regions, uh, uh, the Middle East regions, I mean, you, you cannot just appear the way you want. And when visiting such a places where actually people may have prejudice, she used to wear a long dress so that uh, uh, she may not re uh, uh, um, be repulsive to the ideas of the people in those regions. And then after explaining everything, she could dress in the dress that she was recommending in the testimonies. And we shall see the dress that she was recommending in the testimonies, uh, what kind of dress actually uh, it was. And so the question of dress reform, why should it be handled? And uh, uh, I have already talked about the way all oh God is in the sanctuary, who is a God like unto our God. And when you go to the sanctuary, you find specific dress that people had to wear. And the kamas they are in, they didn't have just to dress the way they wanted. Although you hear, come the way you are. Yes, come the way you are, but do not remain the way you are. When you receive Jesus Christ, you want just to look like Jesus Christ. By the way, the whole plan of redemption is to make us regain the image that we, we lost. And not only that, but go beyond that and be like the angels where they are. In the book of Isaiah chapter 6, just um, uh, I promise not to go in the book of Isaiah chapter 3. You can read it for yourself. It is uh, a long chapter, but it's very interesting. Um, every Seventh-day Adventist, every Christian should read that. But I'll go to Isaiah chapter 6 just to look at uh, the issues in heaven, how they appear. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also saw, I, I saw also the Lord sitting upon the throne high and lifted and his strength filled the temple. And above it stood the seraphims, each one had six wings, which twine he covered his face, and with twine he covered his feet, and with twine he did fly. And so I, I want you to get, I want us to get that aspect that angels are covered fully and that is how reverentially they appear before the lord and so we cannot afford the people who are striving to be on the same level with the angels they cannot give something lesser than what the angels are having we are striving so that we may reach that height that the angels are and we won't stand in that innumerable companies of uh, reverential holy beings to praise the lord while appearing less than what they are and so in our mannerism, in our way of conduct, we are told that we should become more like what heaven is. In fact, in the Lord's Prayer, we are told that it will be done on earth as it is in he heaven. And so when we are praying about the kingdom of heaven to come down on earth, it is not just that literal kingdom we are praying about and the spiritual kingdom uh, it's not only the spiritual I mean, but also the literal kingdom. How things happen in heaven literally, actually they should happen on earth literally. Uh, the very way the angels worship God, the very way they appear in his presence, that is what we are striving for. We are not only praying for us to be revived in the heart, but also even in the outside. And this is no mean by, uh, we can say that this is legalism or uh, uh, uh righteousness by works we are saved by grace and to good works and in the book of romans chapter 12 we are told that uh, offer your body as a living sacrifice it doesn't just say offer your heart alone but also offer your body as a living sacrifice unto the lord and so when we give ourselves to the lord we don't only give the heart but we also give the body which is something physical something that can be seen in the book of hebrews chapter 10 
I want I want us to see this verse Hebrews chapter 10 and uh, it is in principle but not in specifics uh Hebrews chapter 10 verses uh, 5 he says wherefore when he cometh into the world he said sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not but a body thou hast prepared for me or thou hast prepared me and so God himself had to prepare a body for Jesus Christ, this physical body that we are talking about. And uh, I know the connotations that comes with that, those verses, but I want to introduce some point here that also our bodies have to be prepared. Why was the body of Jesus Christ prepared, by the way? So that in this temple of flesh dwelt the divine spirit. And so we are the temple of God that is built so that it may be a habitation of the Holy Spirit. And when you go back to the sanctuary then, for the Shekinah glory to dwell in the temple, it had to be built in a very specific way, both in the inlay and the outlay. You don't find the sanctuary, God considering only the inlay of the sanctuary. He also considered the outlay of the sanctuary itself so that it may be able to be an abode of the Shekinah glory. And so we cannot say that we are only preparing spiritually for the kingdom. We must also prepare physically. We are that temple. We are that sanctuary that is built for the habitation of the Shekinah glory. And so God gave specifics for that sanctuary uh, to be built both in the inward and outside. And uh, you find different materials being used in the building of the sanctuary in the outside, uh, materials for beauty, materials for glory, and the materials for even enduring. You will find that um, inside we had all these uh, articles which were adorned by bronze and uh, they were adorned by some silver and some pure gold. Uh, that was the inward, and this is how we should be dressed inward with that bronze that uh, cannot be uh, 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 cannot uh, rust. And then we have th that silver, something which is precious. Our hearts should be precious hearts, and uh, the goal, that faith that endure it. But when you come outside, also you find that uh, we had different curtains. We had um, uh, uh, the linen clothing, then we had the goat skin, and then we had the Hanabaja's uh, skin. Uh, first of all, we have this linen clothing, which was um, a symbolic of uh, righteousness or um, pureness, but also it was a fine dress uh, for beauty also, because the purpose of the dress question is for glory and then beauty. So it was symbolic for righteousness, these are the, the this denotes the character of uh, the saints, but also it was some peace that was beautiful, and also we had the gold skin which covered the whole uh, linen clothing, and uh, on top of the sanctuary we had the Hanabaja skin. These were materials which actually the weather will not um, uh, 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 affect the person who was inside ministering or could not affect uh, the, the, the sanctuary in a negative way. But uh, it was some skin of enduring. You know how heavy the Hanabaja skin is. You can uh, research on that. And so also our clothes should be clothes that uh, can prevent this physical body from uh, the harm of uh, uh, the harshness of the weather. Not only that, also the clothing should be clothes that um, should be fitting to our body so that we may not develop some complications in diseases and more so in women when uh, their bodies are constricted and uh, they, they end up with different thrombosis, which... Um, uh, uh, thins the, the blood vessels and um, the birth canals and all that, uh, uh, the, the places, I mean, um, the area covering the belly, uh, the birth tract, so that it may not be a problem uh, when they are going through their natural uh, process of uh, getting a child. And they may not have complications uh, of uh, painful uh, 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 
a menstrual period and, though, and, and such a things. And so our clothes are not only symbolic, but also our clothing affects us literally. And so while choosing the material, while choosing everything that goes to our body, let us know that we are preparing this body. The body of Christ was prepared for an habitation of uh, the divine spirit. Also, we are the temple, that temple in the wilderness symbolically. And uh, we have to show forth that we understand what um, we are doing. Fashion is the deteriorating the intellect and eating out the spirituality of our people. Obedient to fashion is pervading our Seventh-day Adventist churches and is doing more than any other power to separate our people from uh, God. And this is the issue that um, uh, there should be a distinction between a church member and a person who is not a church member in their appearance, both physically and spiritually. There should be a distinction when people meet you, they should be able to recognize just by the outward appearance, they can classify you with a certain group of people. I mean, that is so important. You want, you see how important it is when you go to the book of uh, Proverbs, your appearance will automatically make somebody classify you in a certain group. Um, Let us see this in the book of Hebrew, chapter 7. And behold, there met him a woman with the attire of unhallowed and subtle of heart. So you may not be unhallowed, but the attire itself can class you as a hallowed. This is nothing spiritual here. It's a proverb. Yes, you may argue that this is a proverb, proverb but really in in just appearance, physical appearance, somebody can class you. Like uh, if uh, today I marched out of my house with, uh, with, uh, with a regalia of uh, Kenya army and go to the road, the, the, the child or somebody who doesn't understand I'm not in Kenya army will say, uh, maybe that guy is in Kenya army. Just the physical appearance and the dress I'm wearing can make somebody classify me, I belong to a certain group when I do not belong there in any way. And uh, you understand times gone by when people knew only Seventh-day Adventists dress in coats and ties. And if uh, you will just appear somewhere all of a sudden with a coat and uh, a tie, somebody will say that guy belongs to Seventh-day Adventism. That is, that is how important these things are, that um, the way we dress can make people classify us. And so this man, this woman is met on the road and he had an attire of a harlot. And so sometimes we can dress and people say, ah, look, look at that, look at that person. He is this and this. You understand these things well, that um, this uh, Sometimes men wearing their trousers halfway on their back, and uh, somebody will say, "Oh, that look at that guy. That guy is gay." Just people identify that with that, and so you cannot just say God looks at the heart. The people outside there will say who you are, even if you say that God looks at the heart, and they may say the truth or error, but we don't have to appear in a way that people will suggest something that we are not, by the way. It will be better they identify us with something we are not in a positive way and not in a negative way. It will be better somebody to say that, oh, the way you are appearing physically, I think that you are a Christian. Even if you are not a Christian, that is something positive. But you meet somebody and say the way you are appearing, I think, my brother, you look like a, a thug. And you may not be a thug. You may just be poor and you cannot uh, afford dress. But then somebody will identify you with something you are not. It will be better for somebody to identify you with something you are not in a very positive way and not in a negative way. But alas, we have been told that fashion is deteriorating. And we shall be looking at this issue of fashion, how it has 
pervaded and invaded our homes, our churches, and everywhere that uh, we represent the Christendom. And so we should be wary of that thing that our dress speaks of who we are in positive or in negative way. The cloth of man before the fall, Genesis 1, 29, so God created man his own image. In the image of God created he, he male and female, created he them. And uh, Psalms 104, verse 1 and 2, bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord my God, thou art very great, thou art clothed with honor and majesty, who covereth thyself with light, as with garment, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain. This sinless pair wore no artificial garments. They were clothed with a covering of light and glory such as the angels wear. And so that was for protection and for the harsh weather. And the eyes of them both were open. They knew that they were naked and they sealed fig leaves Genesis, together and made themselves up from Genesis 3, 7. Nakedness as a representation of sin. Sometimes when um, we appear naked before the people, it uh, represents how degraded we have been or how neglected we have been. And uh, sometimes you'll hear somebody comment, doesn't that man or woman have anything to cover the child? It shows the neglect or the degradation that we are in when we appear naked. When uh, Adam sealed fig leaves that was not covering himself, it showed how he had been degraded by sin. Some of us can be degraded by poverty. Some can be degraded by a sin. And some can be degraded by knowledge. And that is why they are appearing the way they are appearing. And so whenever we dress, the question that should appear or should cross our mind, are we degraded by sin in our dress reform? Are we degraded naturally because we are poor or are we degraded in our dress reform because we are lacking information and knowledge of how we should be appearing before the people again unto adam also and his wife did the lord god make coats of skins and clothe them genesis 3 21 grace is made a representation of christ character and christ our righteousness an apron uh, a small piece of material uh, and it's only covering the front, no sleeves, usually short. That is an apron. The coat, large piece of material, usually covering the back and front with sleeves, usually long. And uh, these are the things we can look. Today's apron like garments, who is their real inventor? We find that the inventor of the dress in Genesis chapter 3 was God himself. The inventor of the right uh, dress in Genesis chapter 3 was God. Adam never invented anything good after his fall because you find after his fall, he's going downward, downward, and downward. But then God steps in through his son and then he invents something that was um of restore restorative nature the cloth was primarily for a covering she did not know that i gave her corn and wine and oil and multiplied her silver and gold which they prepared for bar therefore i will, will i return and take away thy corn in the time they are open my wine in the season there and will recover my wool and my flax given to cover her nakedness was there two eight and nine and so the reason why god gives us better material and good dress is to cover our nakedness and so one of uh, you see my wool and my flax is given to cover the nakedness and when when you look at the quality of wool and flax you will find that these are materials which uh, are uh, one they are soft they are enduring and they are good for your skin they are not materials that will burn your skin and um, the materials that uh, uh, will cause you uh, uh, problems whether in uh, severe cold or in severe dryness the wool is good material for your body 
and maybe we can speak about um these garments that should not be put on during some certain weathers because we are told of um materials like uh, 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 nylon materials, polyester materials, and uh, other materials that uh, people make with dress, which are not good materials. And so even God recommends the materials that we should be uh, using for uh, dress. I counsel you to buy of me gold tried in the fire that you may be rich and white raiment that you may be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. Revelation 3.18, Behold, I come as a thief, blessed he that watcheth, and keepeth his garments, let he walk, lest he walk naked, and they see his shame. And so, garments are being uh, associated with nakedness, both spiritually and physically. First, is sown in the natural, then in the spiritual. If we will attain any spiritual greatness, then we should strive to use the things that we are given naturally in a better way. Then we will be placed in a better position to appreciate spiritual things. By the way, the way we carry ourselves literally and physically uh, puts us in a condition where we can appreciate spiritual things or not appreciate spiritual things. And so uh, our dress, the way we appear, they can place us in a place that we can, they can place us in an atmosphere where we shall appreciate who God is or not appreciate who God is. Uh, Come down and sit in the dust, O virgin daughter of Babylon. Sit on the ground. There is no throne, O daughter of the Chaldeans. For thou shalt no more be called tender and delicate. Take the milestone and grind meal and cover thy locks. Make bare thy leg and cover thy thigh. Pass over the rivers. Thy nakedness shall be uncovered. Yet thy shame shall be seen. I will take vengeance and I will not meet thee as a man. Isaiah 47, 1 to 3. And so uh, some people struggled with them. Um, when we read... Uh, uh, Exodus 28 verse 42 that uh, thou shall wear a garment that shall cover thy nakedness. Here the Lord says that um, if you make your legs bare and uncover your thighs, then you are naked. And this is something that people may ask, and to what length should I cover my legs? This is this is the natural questions that come out of the minds of the people. To what length should I cover my leg, my legs? But here we are being told that if you make bare thy legs, then you are naked, and we shall be seeing some of these things in specific, uh, specifics. And, and so, uh, it, it goes without saying that um, if uh, you will dress in a way that um, your thighs are exposed, then you have uncovered yourself, you are naked. And that is uh, Isaiah chapter uh, 47. And for Aaron's sons, thou shalt make courts, and uh, thou shalt make for them gardens, and bonnets shalt thou make for them for glory and for beauty. And thou shalt make them linen breeches to cover their nakedness, for from the loins even unto the thighs, says they shall reach. And when you look at uh, Exodus 28, verse 14, 42, um, very, very carefully, you will find that this is not the outer garment in verse 42 that uh, they are talking about. I think the piece of the linen that um, Aaron was wearing, it was something close to transparent. And so he was being told that uh, he shall have another inner garment that shall cover his nakedness. And uh, this, by the way, uh, brings out the ideas of um, uh, how transparent should our clothes be. By the way, if you're wearing, have you ever thought that uh, your garment, if it is transparent, it doesn't much matter how wh wherever it reaches. You may be naked while actually you are even wearing a garment that even covers your leg. If the garment that you are wearing is of light material and transparent, Aaron was told to make that cloth specifically, the inner one, to be able to cover his nakedness. And so you may say that, okay, now I'm wearing a cloth 
that is covering my legs. But if it is transparent, also you are really naked. Uh, sometimes they call it see-me-through. Uh, and when Moses saw that the people were naked, for Aaron had made them naked unto their shame among their enemies. And so when we appear naked before the people, it's a shame of the religion that we profess. These people are the people chosen, a peculiar people for the Lord. But whenever we uh, appear naked, actually it's a shame. Uh, we are told that, um, is it in the book of Romans? I just uh, try to find this. Um, Romans, the name of the Lord, uh, Romans chapter 2, verse 24, for the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you as it is written. So uh, this is the issue. When we appear naked, the name of the Lord is blasphemed among the Gentiles because we are professing a religion that is not being practiced. In Numbers 15, verse 37 to 40, and the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and bid them they make them fringes in the borders of their garments throughout their generations, and that they put upon the fringe of the borders a ribbon of blue, and it shall be unto you for a fringe, that you may look upon it and remember all the commandments of the Lord and do them, and that ye seek not after your own heart and your own eyes, after which ye used to go a whoring, that ye may remember and do all my commandments and be holy unto your God. And I say that, our dress is a, sim a symbol of um, uh, a people who are in obedience to the commandments of the Lord. Deuteronomy 22.5, another verse that is controverted that we shall be looking at. The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man, neither shall a man put on a woman's garment, for all that do so are abomination unto the Lord your God. And uh, the question that arises from this, that uh, the Islam and the Eastern people almost wear the same clothing that is almost so close. Uh, I, I'll think to revisit this, that uh, how was the garment of the man different from the garment of the woman in the Eastern or in the Middle East, so that even though they, wore, they, they, they dress in a whole dress, actually there is a differentiation between what the woman is wearing and what the man is wearing. And uh, also there's the issue of culture that doesn't just allow some things. God, uh, in quotes, respects culture. There are things which are done in some communities that are not acceptable in other communities. And uh, it, it's just like that, and it is natural, by the way. And so you wouldn't actually, again, start arguing based on that. And in the midst of the seven candlestick, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down the foot. And that is what we are. In fact, in 1 John 2, 6, we are told that um, whoever um, says he abides in him must walk as he walked. Now, if you look at Jesus Christ, the way he is wearing his garment in Revelation chapter 1, verse 13, the garment is reaching down the foot. Now, uh, the objection is always there. Sister White said, that our garments should not be sweeping everything on the road. And that is true. And we accept the statement as it is, that our garments should not be sweeping the streets. But uh, the, the principle is there that Christ is covering his nakedness and we should cover our nakedness. And uh, his cloth is reaching at the foot. Where he is actually also is a very important place that we should notice, not in a common place. And so when also we appear, we are in the apartment that he is in. In principle, we are in the apartment that he is in. And how is he appearing before the Father right now? That should be a question that should be also addressed when looking at the issue of um, the dress reform. But who saw but who so shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a milestone were hung upon his neck and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. And um, uh, being your brother's keeper, by the way, uh, if uh, we dress to offend, actually, if we dress to seduce or uh, make people stumble in their ways, you have we, we have had these uh, ideas, women saying, oh, 
men who are tempted by the way ladies are dressed are not converted. And uh, you should be careful with that statement by saying that um, people are not converted because you are dressed bad and they have stumbled. God never intended that um, what we do should be an offense to others or should be a temptation. The last thing you want is to be on certain side trying to tempt people into sin, however converted or unconverted they are. Thou shalt love your neighbor as you love yourself. How comfortable are you when you see people like that? You may be comfortable because your heart has not been brought into a close relationship with God. And if that is the case, you shouldn't think that it is well for you to do the things you are doing because you think others are not converted. But we should be a brother's keeper. We shouldn't be asking such a question that uh, if a man is uh, a stumbling because a woman is not dressing well, then he is not he's not converted. No, that is not the issue. You have heard that it was said by them of all time, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever looks on a woman to lust of her, um, has committed adultery with her already in his heart. Note, this admonition was primarily addressed to men, showing that men were more prone to this kind of sin. Men are drawn by looking. The first thing they are drawn, and um, it is from inspiration we are told that women are drawn by speech and voice, but men are drawn by visual. And so men and women were created in a different way. We are not the same. Even though you may read that uh, they were in the likeness of God, in the image of God, uh, God did not make men to uh, 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 appear like women and women to appear like men. The things that men can handle, sometimes women cannot, and the things that women can handle, men cannot. Men are visual, women are um, voice uh, 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 created, oriented. And so these are the things that we should consider when um, we are talking about um, uh, uh, being a brother's keeper. You know, Richard Baxter, 17th uh, century Puritan preacher, had this to say, if your immodest tend to the ensnaring of the mind of the beholders, though you say you intend it not, it is your sin. And though it be their sin and vanity, that is the cause, it is nevertheless your sin to be the unnecessary occasion. For you must consider that you live among deceased souls and you must not lay a stumbling block in their way, nor blow up the fire of their lust, nor make your ornaments their snares, but you must walk among sinful persons as you will do with a candle among straw or gunpowder, or else you may see the flame which you will not foresee when it is too late to quench it. And so we must abstain from any practice which will blunt the conscience or encourage temptation. We must open no door that will give certain access to the mind of one human being formed in the image of God. This is testimony to the church, volume 5, page 360. In 1 Timothy 2.9, in like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly array. Now, this is important point. The important point, shamefacedness. At least women are being told to wear their clothes in shame facedness, not to be bold in their dress, but to have some kind of shame in it. And what does that really actually mean? It should be that um, when they look at themselves, they should fear that somebody can be drawn by their look, shame facedness. That is what the word means. They should be ashamed that somebody may be attracted to them in a very negative way. And so they should dress in a fearful way, in a shameful way, in a shame-faced way, uh, I say. Uh, and so this is something they should consider while they are dressing themselves. And they should not dress so that it may be a means of seduction, but a means of conversion to other people. If you have trouble getting into it or out of it, it's probably not modest. So what is modest? If you have to be careful when you sit down or bend over, it is probably not modest. If people look at any part of your body before looking at your face, it is probably not modest. If you can see your most private body parts or an outline of those parts under the fabric, it is probably not modest. This is from Michael Hyde, 
Hyatt, CEO of Thomas Nelson Publishers, advice to his five daughters. Interesting. Sleep on a shirt. Cover up with protective clothing. Uh, Aaron's garment says skin cancer. We are told sleep up a shirt. Cover up with protective clothing to guard as much skin as possible when you are out in the sun. Choose comfortable clothes made of tightly woven fabric that you cannot see through when held up to a light. American Cancer Society. Lose fitting. Long sleeve shirts and long pants made from tightly woven fabric offer the best protection from the sun's UV rays. A wet t-shirt offers much less UV protection than a dry one. Darker colors may offer more protection than lighter colors. CDC. Uh, wear a long sleeved shirt and long pants or a long skirt. U.S. Department of Health. Now, these are worldly institutions advising people on how cancer can be gotten just by the way they dress. And so, if the world is speaking about it, why is the church silent about it? In uh, D. Lewis, MD, a word about dress, review and herald, November 25, 1862. A distinguished physician of Paris declared just before his uh, death, I believe that during the 26 years I have practiced my profession in this city, 20,000 children have been born to the cemeteries a sacrifice to the absurd custom of naked arms. Now, people think about naked arms, uh, uh, a message coming from E.G. White, but it came way before even E.G. White could talk about naked arms. And this is a doctor talking about these things. D. Lewis, MD, a word about dress. And so when in Harvard many years ago, I heard the distinguished Dr. J.C. Warren say, Boston sacrifices 500 babies every year by not clothing their arms. Those little arms should have thick, neat woolen, warm sleeves extending from the shoulder to the hand. So here is somebody confessing of um, uh, 20,000 children to the grave because of that just uh, uh, a certain fashion industry. And those are only children. He hasn't mentioned men and women that have gone to the grave because of the way they dress. The limbs were not formed by a creator. This is E.G. White in uh, Testimonies, uh, Volume 2, page 531. The limbs were not formed by our creator to endure exposure, as was the face. The Lord provided the face with an immense circulation because it must be exposed. He provided also large veins and nerves for the limbs and feet to contain a large amount of the current of human life, that the limbs might be uniformly as warm as the body. So uh, here is some... Um, an inspired statement that the face was created to endure nakedness, but the rest of the body was not created for that purpose and uh, it should be uh, covered. We are looking at the uh, question dress. This is number one in the presentation, um, the dress reform, a series of uh, presentations on dress. Again, problems with yeasts and other infections. This is from uh, National Kidney and uh, Urologic Disease Information Clearing House. Uri urinary tract or urinary tract infections in adults assessed in May 18, 2011. Urinary tract infection, UTI, and yeast infection are two of the scourges of womanhood. While there can be many causes for this, both conditions can be directly linked to wearing tight undergarments and pants. When you consider that frequent UTI puts you at risk of the more seriously kidney infection, as well as the cost of treating yeast infection, you must think twice about the perceived benefits of tight undergarments and pants. And so uh, things that uh, we would never have thought about, now the world is talking about them and the church is uh, uh, quiet about them. So just to a recap of the, as uh, we bring this to a close, Dress is symbolic, Genesis 3.21. Dress should be an aid to your spiritual walk, Numbers 15.37 to 40. Dress should be distinctive, Deuteronomy 22.5. Dress should be primarily for a covering, Revelation 3.18. Dress should be modest, 1 Timothy 2.9. Dress plays a role in being your brother's keeper, Matthew chapter uh, 15. These are the things that um, we can ask ourselves, have we been... Uh, walking in the uh, light that God has given unto us, have we closely looked at the Bible principles of dress reform? 
and where have we been lacking and can we ask the Lord for the grace to be able to appear as he would wish us to appear? And so the Lord bless us as we go this through this series. And I know that uh, this is not a condemnation, but information so that uh, we both may grow closer to Christ and our body may be prepared physically and literally to house that Shekinah glory as even the sanctuary was built so that it may be able to bear the Shekinah glory. And so God bless you. And uh, shall we pray to end this our loving Father in heaven, that uh, in the days of ignorance you winged at it, but in these days you command everyone to repent. We cannot of ourselves change our sports, just as the lion cannot change his sports, we cannot change ourselves. We need to be imbued by the Spirit so that um, when Christ speaks to us, we may be able to hear his voice. Help us in the daily life we have walked in this earth, we have been offenders of thy word and offenders of our brethren. Forgive us for that. And some have even gone so long and so wrong. We pray that, uh, Father, you may recover us and uh, you may build us once again to just look like you. In Jesus' name, amen.